sports uh, announcer here at our radio station asked me if I had any contact with the Red Greens, and I said, yeah, he's a friend of mine and nice enough to listen to me, and I go down and visit him once in a while. So uh, I'm down here today at Red Grange's place down in the Indian Lakes Estates, and uh, I'm going to say a few things to him, uh, and I want him to give me a little idea about uh, some of his background in football and so forth. First of all, Red, uh, you were in Wheaton, Illinois. That was your high school, I guess, and you played football up there. And uh, then, uh, what about this ice business? When you were, uh, when you, uh, well, you were known as the Ice Man, and the Ice Man publicized the ice business. All oh, every young kid wanted to carry ice back in those days, and uh, you gave the ice more impetus and probably uh, uh, more popularity than uh, anybody, even though it's pretty popular the way it was. Uh, give me a little dope on that, Red. Well, I think, Coach, I uh, started mainly because I needed the money. I think it was my uh, freshman year in high school. I was probably about 16 years old or so, and I was a kind of a husky kid, and I was walking down the street one day, and our ice man, Mr. Thompson, was uh, weighing some ice on a scale on the back of his truck, and he looked at me and he said, uh, Harold, that was my name, I didn't get the name Red until years later, he said, uh, how would you like to earn five dollars? And I said, five? dollars well that was that was tremendous to the, I never heard of anybody winning fire making five dollars in a day and I said uh, my goodness yes what doing what he said to helping me on Saturday afternoons so I took his deal and the next Saturday afternoon he called me and I went to work on the ice truck and I down through the years I worked for Mr. Thompson on the ice truck uh, three of my high school years and all my four years in college and three or four years when I was playing pro ball. Any success I might have had in athletics, football in particular, I owe, I think, a lot of it to my work on the ice wagon. I would start work at 6 in the morning. Sometimes I'd work till 4, 5, 6 in the afternoon. And uh, make, oh, we'd make up to 50, 60 stops. I'd carry from 25 to 100 pounds of ice. And uh, you're on your legs all the time, using your arms and your shoulders. And I think that was the best development that uh, any young fella could ever have, just that work. And then, generally, if I'd get home before it'd get dark, we'd go out and we'd, my brother and myself, and we'd pass a football for about an hour. So my summer months, June, July, and August, were probably the three months that I worked the hardest when I was playing football, and that includes when I was playing for Coach Upkey at Illinois. Uh, Red, uh, when did you start in Illinois? I played at Illinois, and I started there in 22. I played uh, in 23, 24, and 25. And I was 20 years old my first year on the varsity team, and I was a sophomore. Freshmen were not eligible. I played on the freshman team. Funny thing about our freshman team, though, we were, uh, we practiced about three or four days before school started in 1922, and they threw us into a regulation game with the varsity, and it was a 1919 tie. We tied the varsity, and the next year, we had on the on the starting 11 of the varsity, we had four and five, sometimes six different fellas that had been on the freshman team the year before. Sound to me like you had the wrong team. The freshman ought to have been playing the varsity, and the varsity the other way around. Did you did you say it told me one time you were a little bit discouraged when you first started out there? There's a, of course, there's a great number trying out for football when you were... Oh, yes, because uh, nobody, we had so many out. I think we had 90-some kids out for our freshman team, and uh, nobody knew anybody by name, and they came from all over the state of Illinois. Bert Ingerson, who had played football at, the, at Illinois and later was head coach at Iowa, was our freshman coach at the time. So he would divide us up into about, uh, oh, we'd have gangs of about 20 or 30, and we'd line up on the goal line, and he would snap the ball, and we would have wind sprints. I wind sprinted for years, I think, down there. We'd wind sprint for about, oh, about 20 yards, and line up and wind sprint again all afternoon. And uh, 
Finally, I got so I, I was pretty good on those wind sprints because mainly my athletic ability was on track. I was a good track man. I ran the 100 and the 220 in pretty good time. And I had win most of these wind sprints. And finally, after I'd won, oh, two or three days of wind sprints, why Ingerson came out and he said, kid, come here. And I thought he meant me. I went over anyway. And he said, uh, what's your name? I, I said, I'm Grange from Wheaton. He said, I never heard of either one of you, but you can run pretty well. So he said, you go to that bunch over there in the corner. Well, that was my first recognition. And I went over in the corner and there where you, they sent us they lined us up in different formations and they said well you're going to be a halfback you're a guard you're a tackle and this and that that was my start on the, the freshman team it wasn't uh, easy believe me well now uh, red uh, I, I know all the time you were in school that you were you were a back zupke had you carrying the ball but i talked to chet Wynn about the time you was playing was the uh, uh, last part of illinois and he said he'd checked you out he said you could kick or pass or could run so today you might have been a tailback and said of, uh, they, they, they just were specializing on that particular uh, oh, yes. carrying the ball. Yes, I would have been a tailback. And in fact, the last, uh, I'd say my last two years, uh, Zupka used a, an offense that kind of had a tailback. It was a single wing. But uh, I, I would carry the ball, oh, roughly in the 30s, 32, 33 times in the game. And uh, Britain, our fullback, would carry it, oh, maybe five or six times. So I carried the ball 99 and 100% of the time anyway. Now, Red, you told me uh, when you when you uh, played Michigan, and Michigan had a team, I think it had a tremendous record, and you dedicated the stadium. Of course, the old stadium there is a, is a landmark and pretty dear to most of the people who are Illini, alumni. And uh, you told me something about when it came in at the half, uh, Zepke, uh, who uh, never did pronounce your name as Grange. I said, what do you, how do you, what do you call you? Grinch. 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 And uh, you said he made some remark to you about uh, not getting another touchdown. Tell me, you'd, you'd scored, I think, about three in the first half. Now tell me what he said about that. Well, I scored four in the first 12 minutes in that game. And uh, But let me say right here that that was the greatest blocking that I have ever played in any football game we had on that day. Zepke had the team up very, very high. I don't think on that one certain day that any college team in the United States could have licked us on that day because we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be defeated, that was for sure. And uh, I scored four touchdowns in the first 12 minutes and he took me out of the game. I asked to be taken out because I, w I was uh, tuckered out. And as I walked off the sidelines, he came over and he put his arm around me and he said, Grinch, you should have had another touchdown. He said, on that last time you carried the ball, he said, you cut too quick. You should have taken a few more steps. I knew he was just pulling my leg, or I thought he was anyway, but he seemed very, very serious about it. I'll say one thing, Coach. You never played for Zupke. You never got to be a, a big shot or, or got a big head or anything else, But because he, he would see to that that you did not. He'd slow you down, would he? Oh, he put you right down where you belong. Well, Some, me. Sometime you can get your head too big, and you oh, yeah. have no doubt that uh, you had the publicity there of all, and uh, I suppose you had the greatest amount of publicity of anybody I've ever known in my time and I've been through quite a little bit of that. And uh, I suppose uh, there's no doubt at all about when you get that publicity, some of the other boys who are linemen, they may resent that somewhat. You know what I mean. Uh, and, uh, of course, about the only way a halfback can do a good job is to, is to let those other boys know how, how uh, valuable they are. Otherwise, uh, they might not carry out their assignments like that. They, they're a little, little professional <laughs> jealousy, in, even in college. Yeah. Well, you know, being, a, being an old coach, you you know all about that. I learned the same thing as a freshman in high school at Wheaton, Illinois. I remember it so well. And up for my for my freshman team, and uh, you know I had uh, been had a lot of pats on the backs carrying the ball and things. But uh, we uh, had a pretty good team at the time, and the coach put me in that first game in at right end. I'll never forget that. Never played in before since in my life. And we had one half back. I won't give you his name. He's still alive. He thought he was quite a ball carrier. I mean, he never gave anybody any credit. It's always me or I. I did this. I did that. 
So the 10 other guys on the squad, including myself, at one time out, we got over on the side and we said, he carries the ball on the next play, call him, we'll all get out of the way and see how tough he is. So we lined up. He gets the ball, the tailback, and all of us just jump out of the way, and we tip the other team on the line, though, what we were going to do. And these other 11 came through there, and they pretty near killed him. <laughs> they knocked him for 20 yards or so, and we all stand there looking at him, you know, as he was the great halfback that needed no help. I found out right then that it takes 11 guys to make anything work on a football field. You get the credit if you carry the ball, but I don't think they're the most important parts of a football team at all. It makes uh, those blockers pretty important. Uh, oh, in other words, it's a team game. Yeah, you, a blocker never gets the credit he deserves because you never watch a blocker. I mean, everybody watches the ball carrier and they write about the ball carrier. The guy that's made it possible and has knocked somebody down, maybe knocked two or three people down, and he's the most important man on the play, nobody ever knows who his name is. Now, it's an unfair thing at that. You know that as well as I that's do. That's the way coach. life is. I think a lot of times the people who do, uh, right. you know, uh, now uh, you started off here when you, uh, I want you to tell me something. You told me a little something about C.C. Pyle, a, uh, he was a tremendous promoter and he, I think he operated a theater there in uh, Champaign and uh, he promoted uh, cross country races. One of the, probably the greatest right. one. I'd like to tell you how you, tell me how you got started in pro, how he approached you there. You said he, I think, came into, the, he called you up one time and we were in the theater and, and they wanted to see him in the office and you go on from there. Well, he, uh, my, uh, my home uh, town of uh, at, uh, Champaign when I went to school, Charlie Pyle was my, well, they call them managers in those days. He ran two theaters in the town and I used to go down to the movies once in a while. I'd never heard of Mr. Pyle. I didn't know him. And one day I was attending a movie and the usher came to me and he said, Mr. Pyle would uh, like to see you in his office. Now this was my, my senior year. And I had been playing, of course, going on my, well, I played four years, counting my freshman year. And I said, well, who's Mr. Pyle? And he said, well, he owns and runs this theater and a couple other theaters here in town and in central Illinois. Well, I was ushered up to his office, not knowing who Mr. Pyle was. And I opened the door and here was one of the most immaculate. Charlie Pyle was about 6'1", he weighed about 195 pounds, and he was the best dressed man and best shaved and haircut you ever saw, a little mustache, and you could smell the perfume, and I walked in not knowing what he wanted, and he said his first words before he introduced himself even, he said, Grange, how would you like to make $100,000? I said, what are you talking about? Well, $100,000, that's like a million today, you know. It was, that was tough money in those days. I said, well, of course, of course I'd like to make, a, who would like to make $100,000 legitimately? He says, yes, legitimately. You didn't want to get in jail, did you? No, I, that. You I, 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 I didn't have any idea what Pyle had in mind. He said, well, it's pro football. Now, pro football in, in the 20s, in the early part of the 20s and the middle 20s, was just growing up. It needed help, and uh, they were drawing crowds of old 15, 20,000 people. He said, uh, I'll go to Chicago. I want to talk to George Hallis, who owns and coaches the Chicago Bears, and I can make a deal for you, I am sure, with the Chicago Bears that will, I would say, in two years will make you at least $100,000. I'll guarantee you that. I said, well, I still flabbergasted. I said, well, I'd be willing to listen to you. I'd certainly like to hear about it. He said, I'll get back to you in about 10 days, probably maybe two weeks. And at that, he said, goodbye, glad to see you. And that was it. And I heard no more from him. It was about two weeks later, and uh, 
he invited me down to his office and uh, he laid this whole situation out. I was to join the Chicago Bears and we were to take a road trip of playing about 15, 16 games. And uh, he and I, he was to get, uh, wasn't a salary, it was a, cer a certain percentage of the gate. Now his deal with the Bears at that time was if they were drawing a certain amount of fans to each game, anything over that amount, why we cut up between, I forget how the percentage was, but anyway, uh, I, I was to receive 70% of what we received and Pyle was to get 30% for making the deal. And that was the way it started and he went off to Chicago and set up the deal. He felt pretty sure that the double attendance of Red Grange got in on the, in on the program and on the game. There's no doubt about it. I remember that very well. And uh, it was a, a tremendous amount of attendance there to come to see you. Now, what different cities did you go to? You, you, you started, where did you start off? You had a four or five, you played all over the country, didn't you? Oh, yes. I, uh, we played eight games in 12 days to start with, and uh, we played our first game. My first game with the Chicago Bears and my first pro game was on Thanksgiving Day, 1925. I had uh, finished my college career the Saturday before Thanksgiving at Ohio State. And I'd taken the train from Columbus, Ohio into Chicago and uh, Monday was my first uh, practice with the Chicago Bears, Monday after, just before Thanksgiving Day. And I practiced Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, three days and then played with them on Thursday on Thanksgiving. And we had, uh, we had a crowd, well, they couldn't get in on Wrigley Field, which seated at that time, I think, about 50,000 people, and they had been drawing about 15. And uh, they broke down some of the uh, gates trying to get into the, uh, to the ballpark. We played the Chicago Cardinals, and that was my first pro game, was Thanksgiving Day, 1925. Never forget. Remember how the game came out, Ed? Yeah, we won the game. I think it was, uh, if I remember right, I believe it was 14 to six. Uh, Red, uh, I think the, the average person in this day and age doesn't realize what disrepute pro football was in back when you started playing. I remember that uh, anybody who played pro football uh, was looked upon maybe as a, as a traitor to the cause, and the publicity on the pro games might have been two or three inches. It, it, nobody can imagine in uh, the attitude that the public had toward people who played pro ball. And I know you encountered some of those things when you played ball, pro ball played your uh, pro ball and you had been a hero there in college and uh, all the kids and so forth and the people and the grown-ups and everybody looked upon you and everybody looked upon that thing as a kind of a disgrace now uh, give me give me a little idea about that what actually happened to you in this particular case well I think the same thing happened to me but the one thing that I take credit for and many football people have given me credit for that I at least got some of the publicity on the front page of the sport page. And as you say, before that it would be, oh, on the third or fourth page, it would be about an inch high and say so-and-so defeated so-and-so and that was it. Now, Red, you told me one time it is four prominent sport writers. They were the big wheels. And they took an interest in pro ball, and which gave it probably more impetus than any other one thing. Who were those four people? And tell me about that. Well, I think the uh, the main main one that I can think of was Grantland and Rice, and he was syndicated all over the United States. Most of the uh, writers in those days were just local writers that just wrote for the one paper. But uh, when you talk to Rice you would be in papers all over the United States. He used to come down and cover about one, maybe two games that we might have at Illinois, and he'd make the Western Circuit every once in a while. And he was from New York, and they, well, they thought we were still fighting the Indians out around Chicago at that time, you know. I believe the, you had Damon Runyon. He was a Damon one Runyon of the came by. writer. Yes, he was a syndicated writer. But the, all the syndicated writers were from the East, were from Philadelphia and New York. And very rarely would uh, you have anyone out of any other community except those two. When we went to, took our trip and went to California when I first joined the Bears, then we got some, some very good publicity. Finally, they quit writing about 
professional football was the wrong thing to do and started writing about the football game, which was a great game. It was uh, good blocking, good tackling, had good coaching, and had some of the best players. It was, uh, well, I'd say at least three or four years before the papers really opened up. And I think the one thing, though, that helped more than anything else about that time, radio was just coming in, and it was getting big, and they needed sports on radio. And we finally got some of the pro games on radio, and it went throughout the United States. Now, they never heard of professional football in those days down through the south or out on the west until the radio came along. Then they got interested in the game, and it used to be, oh, any time you would make any, any trip, to any of these western or southern towns, you'd get in arguments about the blocking and the tackling, which made you think that they were interested in it, which I think they were. But I'd say it took a good three or four years after I joined the Chicago Bears to uh, really feel that it was a part of our sports program in this country to take its place with basketball and baseball and the other sports. Uh, you, uh, of the players that you knew, who do you think, who kind of stands out in your mind, a half a dozen or so up there, uh, as uh, uh, backs and as linemen? Uh, I think you mentioned Nagurski one time. Well, what a, uh, give us a little briefing on some of those boys. Well, I think the, uh, well, I say the best or the greatest, any way you want to phrase it, football player that I ever saw was Bronco Nagurski, and I had the good fortune to play with Bronk and uh, to know him and to room with him when he was with the Chicago Bears. He came out of the University of Minnesota, and he was big for those days. Uh, we, well, a lineman that weighed 190 pounds in the 20s, he was a good South lineman. Bronk was fast. He was well, about six foot two, and he weighed about 235 pounds, which was a big man in the in the 20s. And he was a great competitor. He loved it. He just loved to block, and he loved to tackle. He loved to hit things. And uh, it, during the week, if he couldn't go out and practice, he'd go out and he'd hit that dummy three or four or five or a hundred times. You know, I've never met anyone that I thought was as tough as Nagurski on a football field. He just loved that contact. Now, what about the uh, some of the maybe two or three backs? Who do you uh, what do you consider to be the some of the outstanding backs? Maybe a, well, I think one of the best backs I ever saw, who came from a relatively smaller school, uh, uh, was uh, well, he's West Virginia Wesleyan was Cliff Battles. <clears throat> Pardon me, Cliff played for the Washington Ball Club and played in New York, and uh, I made uh, well, let's see, two or three barnstorming trips after the season was over with. Cliff. He was big. He could run. He could do everything. Great kicker. He could pass. Well, had it, had it been today, why uh, Cliff would have been one of the outstanding football players of all time. I would say he was the greatest uh, back that I can remember. He and the Gursky. I would put those two as my two greatest backs. Now, I played one game against Jim Thorpe, and uh, Jim was brought into uh, uh, I forget, it's some small town we played in the Middle West, and he was uh, brought in to play on a pickup team, and he only played about one quarter, and then he got out. But he still, he was in his 40 years old at that time, and you could still see that he had been a great football player. He was big, and he was strong, and he loved it. He loved that contact. He loved to run into people, and that's what it takes. I went down to Kansas City, and he played the Kansas City oh, yes. Bulldogs, and he was... Uh... Uh, he was with the Canton. Uh, we had the Canton Bulldogs. The Canton, yeah, Canton Bulldogs. Canton Bulldogs. They played the Kansas City Cowboys. Yes. And uh, he did something unusual. He, he he'd kicked the ball. When he punted the ball, it didn't spiral. It just seemed like it took off in the air and uh, did all kinds of contortions of the ball, making it difficult to catch. But the thing that impressed me was when he played safety, the ball, the kicker would punt the ball. He would duck his head and run and never look up. And when he stopped, he didn't have to take a step either way or two and caught the ball. I never saw anybody could judge a ball as well as, as, as well as he could. I never saw anything well, like that. Well, I don't think there's ever been a better back than Jim when he was in his prime. He could do everything. He was big. 
and they, they tell me George Hallis used to play against him before my time even, and that goes back a long, long time, believe me. George claimed that he was, he was one of the three or four greatest football players that he had ever seen, and Hallis up until, oh, maybe 10 years ago had seen most all of them. Every football, old-time football player that I have ever talked to that had ever seen or ever played against Jim or played with him would say the same thing. He was big, he was strong, he liked to win, and he, he gave it everything he had, and I don't think there's ever been a better football player than Jim Thorpe. Uh, Mrs. Grange, uh, Mrs. Grange, uh, tell them something about how what part you play in operating this beautiful home here. You used to be a flight attendant, were you not? Uh, and you met Red, and you, 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 nobody else could catch Red, but you caught Red, didn't you? All the other backs and all the other defensive men. Him. That was all. You just waited for I him. I just waited for him. I know. I was you? a stewardess in those days. We were called stewardesses. You did a fine job, and uh, I know uh, this has been you've been beautiful people, and you and Red are most gracious people, and we love. You and I haven't known you too many years, except publicly, publicly wise. Uh, we've known you a long time, and uh, I'm going to have to wind this thing off. I was going to talk to you, you to talk to me a little bit about McKendry College, Red. Uh, uh, one of my old good buddies there in Illinois, who coached and played at McKendry College, uh, they used to have some pretty good ball players out there, pretty good team there. I think they used to win that conference quite often, and uh, I know you've talked about them several times, and. Uh, I think maybe that uh, we're going to wind this thing up because Red has some people coming in here, and I kind of barged in on him, and uh, I wish we had a little more time. But uh, this, uh, hey, one little thing, Red, what about this candy bar? The kids used to chew on that Red Grange candy bar. Uh, did that make it make you any money? Yes, it did. It made me more money than uh, than playing football at the time, really. Uh, they called me, one of the big manufacturers of candy called me one day, and they wanted to put out a candy bar with my name on. I couldn't figure why. They said, well, kids growing up and want to play football, they know your name, and they like to sell candy, and they like to buy candy, so they're our customers. So I gave them permission, and uh, I made more... The second year, I believe it was, when I was playing pro ball that this came about, I made more that year out of that candy bar than I did playing professional football. And uh, I'd made pretty well out of professional football. Then other things came in, you know. I had a, a sweater with my name on it and uh, some football equipment and a headgear and uh, a bicycle and all oh, quite a lot of different things that they used to put my name on. But I was uh, always careful about it to the extent that I, I never allowed my name to be put on something that I thought was junk. If I couldn't try it out or have it tried out or know what it was pretty well and what they were going to do with it, and uh, uh, I, I just wouldn't agree to it. So I was I was choosy about it. I think that's a character of Red Grange, and I find him to be the same way in the, a little, as he becomes a little older here, and uh, he has been uh, uh, a credit to the professional football to all kind of athletics and to all living he's a good clean liver and uh, as far as I know uh, he's got no enemies in this world and uh, he's uh, got a beautiful home down here at Indian Indian Lakes Estates he's right here back here on a big beautiful skin clothes swimming pool right back on a beautiful little lake here and got him a fine one of the most gracious wives you've ever seen and so uh, if this kind of suffices a little bit why well, I'll have old Red to tell you goodbye on there tell him goodbye Red I say goodbye and let me thank the coach too. It's real nice of you to say that. Now I understand how you could pep those teams up that you coached in years gone by. Believe me. Thanks a lot, coach. They got so they kind of hated me. That's, what, that's <laughs> part of the thing. Well, thank you, Red. Okay. <laughs>